Book Six, Canto Eight of the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Canto Eight. Prince Arthur overcomes disdain, quites Mirabelle from dread. Serena, found of salvages, by Calipine is freed. Ye gentle ladies, in whose sovereign power love hath the glory of his kingdom left, and the hearts of men, as your eternal dower, in iron chains of liberty bereft, delivered hath into your hands by gift, be well aware how ye the same do use, that pride do not to tyranny you lift, lest if men you of cruelty accuse, he from you take that chiefdom which ye do abuse and as ye soft and tender are by kind adorned with goodly gifts of beauty's grace so be ye soft and tender eke in mind but cruelty and hardness from you chase that all your other praises will deface and from you turn the love of men to hate an example take of mirabella's case who from the high degree of happy state fell into wretched woes which she repented late who after thraldom of the gentle squire which she beheld with lamentable eye was touched with compassion entire and much lamented his calamity that for her sake fell into misery which booted not for prayers nor for threat to hope for to release or mollify for a the more that she did them entreat the more they him misused and cruelly did beat so as they forward on their way did pass him still reviling and afflicting sore they met prince arthur and sir ennius that was that courteous knight whom he before having subdued yet did to life restore to whom as they approached they gan augment their cruelty and him to punish more scourging and hailing him more vehement as if it them should grieve to see his punishment the squire himself when as he saw his lord the witness of his wretchedness in place was much ashamed that with an hempen cord he like a dog was led in captive case and did his head for bashfulness abase as loath to see or to be seen at all shame would be hid but when as ennius beheld two such of two such villains thrall his manly mind was much immoved therewithal and to the prince thus said see you sir knight the greatest shame that ever i yet saw yon lady and her squire with foul despite abused against all reason and all law without regard of pity or of awe see how they do that squire beat and revile see how they do the lady hail and draw but if ye please to lend me leave a while i will them soon acquite and both of blame assoil the prince assented and then he straightway dismounting light his shield about him threw with which approaching thus he gan to say abide ye caitiff treachetours untrue that have with treason thralled unto you these two unworthy of your wretched bands and now your crime with cruelty pursue abide and from them lay your loathly hands or else abide the death that hard before you stands the villain stayed not answer to invent but with his iron club preparing way his mind sad message back unto him sent the which descended with such dreadful sway that seemed not the course thereof could stay no more than lightning from the lofty sky ne list the knight the power thereof assay whose doom was death but lightly slipping by unwares defrauded his intended destiny and to requite him with the like again with his sharp sword he fiercely at him flew and struck so strongly that the carl with pain saved himself but that he there him slew yet saved not so but that the blood it drew and gave his foe good hope of victory who therewith fleshed upon him set anew and with the second stroke sought certainly to have supplied the first and paid the usury but fortune answered not unto his call for as his hand was heaved up on height the villain met him in the middle fall and with his club bet back his brand-iron bright so forcibly that with his own hand's might rebeaten back upon himself again he driven was to ground in self-despite from whence ere he recovery could gain he in his neck had set his foot with fell disdain with that the fool which did that end await came running in and whilst on ground he lay laid heavy hands on him and held so straight that down he kept him with his scornful sway so that he could not weld him any way the whiles that other villain went about him to have bound and thralled without delay whiles the fool did him revile and flout 
threatening to yoke them too and tame their courage stout as when a sturdy ploughman with his hind by strength have overthrown a stubborn steer they down him hold and fast with cords do bind till they him force the buxom yoke to bear so did these two this night oft tug and tear which when the prince beheld there standing by he left his lofty steed to aid him near and buckling soon himself gan fiercely fly upon that carl to save his friend from jeopardy the villain leaving him unto his mate to be captived and handled as he list himself addressed unto his new debate and with his club him all about so blist that he which way to turn him scarcely wist sometimes a lofty laid sometimes a low now here now there and oft him near he missed so doubtfully that hardly one could know whether more wary were to give or ward the blow but yet the prince so well inured was with such huge strokes approved oft in fight that way to them he gave forthright to pass and it would endure the danger of their might but wait advantage when they down did light at last the caitiff after long discourse when all his strokes he saw avoided quite resolved in one to assemble all his force and make one end of him without ruth or remorse his dreadful hand he heaved up aloft and with his dreadful instrument of ire thought sure have pounded him to powder soft or deep emboweled in the earth entire but fortune did not with his will conspire for ere his stroke attained his intent the noble child preventing his desire under his club with wary boldness went and smote him on the knee that never yet was bent it never yet was bent ne bent it now albeit the stroke so strong and puissant were that seemed a marble pillar it could bow but all that leg which did his body bear it cracked throughout yet did no blood appear so as it was unable to support so huge a burden on such broken gear but fell to ground like to a lump of dirt whence he essayed to rise but could not for his hurt eftsoons the prince to him full nimbly stepped and lest he should recover foot again his head meant from his shoulders to have swept which when the lady saw she cried amain stay stay sir knight for love of god abstain from that unwares ye wheatless do intend slay not that carl though worthy to be slain for more on him doth than himself depend my life will by his death have lamentable end he stayed his hand according her desire yet not the more him suffered to arise but still suppressing gan of her inquire what meaning mote those uncouth words comprise that in that villain's health her safety lies that were no might in man nor heart in knights which durst her dreaded rescue enterprise yet heavens themselves that favor feeble rights would for itself redress and punish such despites then bursting forth in tears which gushed fast like many water streams a while she stayed till the sharp passion being overpast her tongue to her restored then thus she said nor heavens nor men can me most wretched maid deliver from the doom of my desart the which the god of love hath on me laid and damned to endure this direful smart for penance of my proud and hard rebellious heart in prime of youthly years when first the flower of beauty gan to bud and blossom delight and nature me endued with plenteous dower of all her gifts that pleased each living sight i was beloved of many a gentle knight and sued and sought with all the service due full many a one for me deep groaned in sight and to the door of death for sorrow drew complaining out on me that would not on them rue but let them love that list or live or die me list not die for any lover's duel ne list me leave my loved liberty to pity him that list to play the fool to love myself i learned had in school thus i triumphed long in lover's pain and sitting careless on the scorner's stool did laugh at those that did lament and plain but all is now repaid with interest again for lo the winged god that woundeth hearts caused me be called to account therefore and for revengement of those wrongful smarts which i to others did inflict afore had deemed me to endure this penance sore that in this wise and this unmeet array with these two lewd companions and no more disdain and scorn i through the world should stray till i have saved so many as i erst did slay certes 
said then the prince, the god is just that taketh vengeance of his people's spoil, for were no law in love, but all that lust might them oppress and painfully turmoil, his kingdom would continue but a while. But tell me, lady, wherefore do you bear this bottle thus before you with such toil, and eke this wallet at your back arrear, that for these carls to carry much more comely were? Here in this bottle, said the sorry maid, I put the tears of my contrition, till to the brim I have it full defrayed, and in this bag which I behind me don, I put repentance for things past and gone. Yet is the bottle leak, and bag so torn that all which I put in falls out anon, and is behind me trodden down of scorn, who mocketh all my pain, and laughs the more I mourn. The infant hearkened wisely to her tale, and wondered much at Cupid's judgment wise, that could so meekly make proud hearts avail, and wreak himself on them that him despise. Then suffered he disdain up to arise, who was not able up himself to rear, by means his leg, through his late luckless prize, was cracked in twain, but by his foolish fear was hopen up, who him supported standing near. But being up, he looked again aloft, as if he never had received fall, and with stern eyebrows stared at him oft, as if he would have daunted him with all, and standing on his tiptoes to seem tall, down on his golden feet he often gazed, as if such pride the other could appall, who was so far from being aught amazed, that he his looks despised and his boast dispraised. Then, turning back unto that captive thrall, who all this while stood there beside them bound, unwilling to be known or seen at all, he from those bands weaned him to have unwound. But when approaching near he plainly found it was his own true groom, the gentle squire, he thereat wexed exceedingly astound, and him did oft embrace and oft admire, he could with seeing satisfy his great desire. Meanwhile the salvage man, when he beheld that huge great fool oppressing the other knight, whom with his weight unwieldy down he held, he flew upon him like a greedy kite unto some carrion offered to his sight, and down him plucking with his nails and teeth gan him to hail and tear and scratch and bite, and from him taking his own whip therewith so sore him scourgeth that the blood down followeth. And sure I ween, had not the lady's cry procured the prince his cruel hand to stay, he would with whipping him have done to die. But being checked, he did abstain straightway and let him rise. Then thus the prince gan say, Now, lady, sith your fortunes thus dispose that if ye list have liberty ye may, unto yourself I freely leave to choose whether I shall you leave or from these villains loose. Ah, nay, Sir Knight, said she, it may not be, but that I needs must by all means fulfill this penance which enjoined is to me, lest unto me betide a greater ill, yet no less thanks to you for your good will. So humbly taking leave, she turned aside, but Arthur with the rest went onward still on his first quest, in which did him betide a great adventure, which did him from them divide. But first it falleth me by course to tell of fair Serena, who, as erst you heard, when first the gentle squire at variance fell with those two carls, fled fast away, afeard of villainy to be to her inferred. So fresh the image of her former dread, yet dwelling in her eye to her appeared, that every foot did tremble which did tread, and every body two and two she four did read. Through hills and dales, through bushes and through briers, long thus she fled, till that at last she thought herself now past the peril of her fears. Then, looking round about and seeing not which doubt of danger to her offer mot, she from her palfrey lighted on the plain, and sitting down, herself a while bethought of her long travel and turmoiling pain, and often did of love, and oft of luck complain. And evermore she blamed Calapine, the good Sir Calapine, her own true knight, as the only author of her woeful tine, for being of his love to her so light, as her to leave in such a piteous plight. Yet never turtle truer to his make than he was tried unto his lady bright, who all this while endured for her sake great peril of his life, and restless pains did take. 
though when as all her plaint she had displayed and well disburdened her ingrieved breast upon the grass herself adown she laid where being tired with travel and oppressed with sorrow she betook herself to rest there whilst in morpheus bosom safe she lay fearless of aught that mote her peace molest false fortune did her safety betray unto a strange mischance that menaced her decay in these wild deserts where she now abode there dwelt a salvage nation which did live of stealth and spoil and making nightly rode into their neighbors borders they did give themselves to any trade as for to drive the painful plough or cattle for to breed or buy adventurous merchandise to thrive but on the labors of poor men to feed and serve their own necessities with others need thereto they used one most accursed order to eat the flesh of men whom they mote find and strangers to devour which on their border were brought by error or by wreckful wind a monstrous cruelty against course of kind they towards evening wandering every way to seek for booty came by fortune blind whereas this lady like a sheep astray now drowned in the depth of sleep all fearless lay soon as they spied her lord what gladful glee they made amongst themselves but when her face like the fair ivory shining they did see each gan his fellow solace and embrace for joy of such good hap by heavenly grace then gan they to devise what course to take whether to slay her there upon the place or suffer her out of her sleep to wake and then her eat at once or many meals to make the best advisement was of bad to let her sleep out her fill without encumberment for sleep they said would make her battle better then when she waked they all gave one consent that since by grace of god she there was sent unto their god they would her sacrifice who share her guiltless blood they would present but of her dainty flesh they did devise to make a common feast and feed with gurmandise so round about her they themselves did place upon the grass and diversely dispose as each thought best to spend the lingering space some with their eyes the daintest morsels chose some praise her paps some praise her lips and nose some wet their knives and strip their elbows bare the priest himself a garland doth compose of finest flowers and with full busy care his bloody vessels wash and holy fire prepare the damsel wakes then all at once up start and round about her flock like many flies hooping and hallowing on every part as if they would have rent the brazen skies which when she sees with ghastly griefful eyes her heart does quake and deadly pallid hue benumbs her cheeks then out aloud she cries where none is nigh to hear that will her rue and rends her golden locks and snowy breasts and brew but all boots not they hands upon her lay and first they spoil her of her jewels dear and afterwards of all her rich array the which amongst them they in pieces tear and of the prey each one a part doth bear now being naked to their sordid eyes the goodly treasures of nature appear which as they view with lustful fantasies each wisheth to himself and to the rest and vies her ivory neck her alablaster breast her paps which like two silken pillows were for love in soft delight thereon to rest her tender sides her belly white and clear which like an altar did itself uprear to offer sacrifice divine thereon her goodly thighs whose glory did appear like a triumphal arch and thereupon the spoils of princes hanged which were in battle won those dainty parts the dearlings of delight which mote not be profaned of common eyes those villains viewed with loose lascivious sight and closely tempted with their crafty spies and some of them gan amongst themselves devise thereof by force to take their beastly pleasure but them the priest rebuking did advise to dare not to pollute so sacred treasure vowed to the gods religion held even thieves in measure so being stayed they her from thence directed unto a little grove not far aside in which an altar shortly they erected to slay her on and now the eventide his broad black wings had through the heavens wide by this to spread 
that was the time ordained for such a dismal deed their guilt to hide a few green turfs and altar soon they feigned and decked it all with flowers which they nigh hand obtained though when as all things ready were aright the damsel was before the altar set being already dead with fearful fright to whom the priest with naked arms full net approaching nigh and murderous knife well wet gan mutter close a certain secret charm with other devilish ceremonies met which done he gan aloft advance his arm whereat they shouted all and made a loud alarm then gan the bagpipes and the horns to shrill and shriek aloud that with the people's voice confused did the air with terror fill and made the wood to tremble at the noise the while she wailed the more they did rejoice now mote ye understand that to this grove sir calapine by chance more than by choice the self same evening fortune hither drove as he to seek serena through the woods did rove long had he sought her and through many a soil had travelled still on foot in heavy arms nay aught was tired with his endless toils nay aught was feared of his certain harms and now all wheatless of the wretched storms in which his love was lost he slept full fast till being waked with these loud alarms he lightly started up like one aghast and catching up his arms straight to the noise forth passed there by the uncertain glimpse of starry night and by the twinkling of their sacred fire he mote perceive a little dawning sight of all which there was doing in that choir mongst whom a woman spoiled of all attire he spied lamenting her unlucky strife and groaning sore from grieved heart and tire eftsoons he saw one with a naked knife ready to launch her breast and let out loved life with that he thrusts into the thickest throng and even as his right hand adown descends he him preventing lays on earth along and sacrificeth to the infernal fiends then to the rest his wrathful hand he bends of whom he makes such havoc and such hue that swarms of damned souls to hell he sends the rest that scape his sword and death is chew fly like a flock of doves before a falcon's view from them returning to that lady back whom by the altar he doth sitting find yet fearing death and next to death the lack of clothes to cover what they ought by kind he first her hands beginneth to unbind and then to question of her present woe and afterwards to cheer with speeches kind but she for not that he could say or do one word durst speak or answer him a whit thereto so inward shame of her uncomely case she did conceive through care of womanhood that though the night did cover her disgrace yet she in so unwomanly a mood would not bewray the state in which she stood so all that night to him unknown she passed but day that doth discover bad and good ensuing made her known to him at last the end whereof i'll keep until another cast End of Canto 8. Recording by Thomas Copeland.